This is In Depth with Larry Flick on Sirius XM. I am having the best day ever. Why? Because one of my absolute 100% all-time favorite people is visiting with me today. I haven't seen her in about a year or two, but it feels like it was just yesterday. That's how you know you really have a connection with somebody when time disappears when you run into each other. Jennifer Beals is in the studio. And here's the thing. You know me now. Yes. I mean it. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. The feeling is mutual. We've okay. had some really wonderful conversations in our time together, and I am just so, so grateful to see you. You look fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited. So you are, every time I, every time I, uh, I, I flip on um, a device, I see Jennifer Beals is doing this and doing that. You look uniquely rested for someone who works as hard as you do. <laughs> How are you I pulling made, that off? I made sure to get to bed early. I go to bed early. Do you go to bed early? Yes. So I you really are. To. Before we turn the mics on, she's like, sometimes I'm like a hundred year old woman. <laughs> yes. And you kind of are, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> I like, see, yeah. I'm the hundred year old woman too. <laughs> I'm like, I roll down my, rest. Rest roll down my nylons rolls. and just put my feet up. <laughs> <laughs> Bust out the cold cream. You know, no, cucumbers. Uh, you know what? Beyond the cold cream, beyond the cucumbers. We're just moving on. We don't even need it. We don't want it. You know what? I say age with dignity. Just age. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. The lines are beautiful, yeah. I think. No pressure aging. So so Jennifer is here to talk about a number of things, including and starting with the return of the L word, this time subtitled Generation Q. It's on Showtime. Uh, Ten years after it left us the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're one of the executive producers this time, which yes. means you have a driving interest in the story and in the way it looks. And I've seen uh, a lot of it so far, and it looks great. Oh, good. Thank you. It is a very satisfying return. I'm not a big fan of reboots, but I was curious to see what had happened to these women and how these women would feel in 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, because some shows have hurt their legacy mm. by coming back. Mm -hmm. Some really important shows have hurt their legacy by coming back. And I feel like this is going to enhance the legacy of the L word. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that because you're here, because I would say to you, hmm, yes. you're back. <laughs> I would find a way around offering an opinion. Um, so let's let's start from the, the basic, and then we'll get deeper and deeper. Um, you were wondering what happened to, to them as well? Well, I think it's less of a reboot and more like a rebel yell. Like that's what, how I envisioned the show. Um, when, when we went off the air, uh, Kate, Leisha and I, Kate Menig, Leisha Haley and I, um, all expected the show to, some, something to replace the show. Something with a similar, um, you know, feeling to, to replace the show. Some lesbian centric something to take its place and nothing did which was surprising because it was so successful uh and then as time went on we you know thought wouldn't it be kind of wonderful to bring the show back particularly when we were made aware that so many people were still talking about the show online in chat rooms and on social media and and not only that but that these conversations were were beginning to change like you 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 started to feel that the ground was moving beneath your feet and the air between people was starting to change because this new generation was starting an entirely different conversation. When we had gone off the air, there was no same-sex marriage. And then now, here we are 10 years later, and our whole way of using language to describe gender identity and sexual orientation is is changed. And, and this whole new generation is refusing to let other people categorize them they are they are demanding to define themselves and that to me is incredibly exciting to continue the l word and broaden the community so that we can have those conversations through character you know as i was watching the first episode of of generation q um i was asking myself the same question because L word was so important, and and 
sometimes in something that's important it starts to feel like vegetables before you get your pudding. <laughs> but it never felt that way. And 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 I thought about how different things are and how um and how there is a lot more queerness in, in pop culture, but there's not a lot of female queerness yes. in pop culture. Right. And I started to think about that. And I started to think about one of the reasons why I think it is. And before I share my opinion, I'd love to hear what you think. Why do you think there's less? There's a lot of queerness. We see a lot of men getting down with other men. And a lot of, you know, we're even seeing a, a greater influence of trans people. And we're seeing a lot of a lot of things that do not include two women. I'm not sure what that is. What's your opinion? My opinion is that we're still uh, witnessing a male-driven industry mm. and that men have a harder time with women who are queer because it's the ultimate rejection mm. of their genitalia. Mm. That when a, when a straight man is dealing with a queer man, he's dealing with what he perceives as being lust for him. Oh, as opposed to rejection for what he wants. See, I had always thought that homophobia in general was a form of misogyny. It is. You know, and it is because no man wants to be told you can't have that. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, what I'm very grateful for is that uh, the trans community is getting so much support. Um, because obviously they're in dire need. With I know, but here's what's really interesting. the trans It's the trans female community that's getting all the attention. The trans male community is still fighting to be seen. And again, it's a rejection of what was born, what people think is born a woman rejecting manhood for their own version of it. Wow, that's very, very interesting. And... It's, it's it, 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 someone listening right now could think that bitch is stupid, but I stand by it. No, no, it's I'm, really interesting. Uh, you know, I've been I've been an out queer man for over thirty years, mm -hmm. and I've been in the pop culture world for thirty five years. And if there's anything I've seen, it is how men will say, even when they know I'm in the room as a queer person, and all she really needs is. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. And it's always like, you know, I know you want me, but and you can't you, have and me. And what do you say? Like I always that. say, you know what? If she wanted it, she'd ask for it. <laughs> 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 yeah. She ain't looking for you, baby. Yeah, exactly. She ain't looking for you. Don't be, don't be so mad. Wow, that they just assume that you're an ally. Well, because, you know, men are men are men. And in some ways, men are men. Um, and that's why game knows game. Mm -hmm. I could be a queer person who loves my husband, but I understand the male psyche mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we do share some things in common, some things that I don't like having right. as a man. Um, so the return of this show is so perfectly timed to my person, personal belief because mm -hmm. as we soak into you know the me too era to the new defiance of women in pop culture mm -hmm. what's been missing is the queer voice mhm mm mhm mm i mean i think you've had the queer voice pretty well represented in some ways with with uh, in the trans community but to broaden that community to to be uh, more inclusive I think is is something that we need right now, and I think that's what I one of the things I love about the new L word. What I loved about what I saw is the other thing that I believe even a lot of other of the LGBTQ letters sometimes secretly say, which is that women can be more fluid about what they're willing to accept, and in the show. That's not the case. In what way? What do you mean? Um, that, you know, uh, there's, there's, there are actual studies of women who identify as bi or, or pan or lesbian until they're ready to have a family. Mm. And then they enter a traditional mm -hmm. hetero, hetero marriage. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this show is so not that point of view. It's deliciously defiant, Jennifer. It is defiant, though there are some heteronormative... 
um, goals that are within it in terms of family and marriage and and but there it has its own spin on it it has its own uh, definition of that you know when you were when you were sitting with I'm, I'm assuming as one of the executive producers you sat with the writers and the directors and and you know the other two lead women of the piece are also EPs on the mm -hmm. show correct mm -hmm. um, what did you say you wanted from this experience well when we were meeting with possible showrunners, um, the only given was that we knew that we wanted Bette to be running for office and for Alice to have a show. And, and then we were very curious about what you know, other people's visions were for the future of the show. Um, when we sat down, well, I'll speak for myself. When mm. I sat down with the writers, um, it was really important to me to... Uh, talk about race, to talk about aging, to talk about parenting um, for my character and, and, and the, the shift of power and how you experience power and what that means. Um, you know, having said all those things, I believe that it's important to give a showrunner the space to write to their passion and write to their imagination. I don't want to dictate every thing to someone. I don't think it's in my best interest or their best interest or the show's best interest to do that. And so, uh, you know, Marja really, um, you know, dove into the things that excited her. And, and I think, you know, it's to our benefit. The thing I also found exciting about this return is how generationally it didn't feel as, as wide a chasm as I sometimes fear there is between my age group and younger people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like we're seeing more commonality in in the women of different ages on this show. Yeah, and I, do you think that's a function of the queer community too? Um, I do, I do. I think women are far less obsessed with it mm -hmm. than men are. Mm -hmm. I do, I think men are very, very, very committed to there's a lot of ageism among okay. men, um, and I don't. And I, you don't think that's true among women? Um, not in my experience. Okay. Not in my experience, but you know, I'm not a woman, so there's only so much I can observe. <laughs> uh, you know, as as sometimes as an outsider, I recognize that you know, as much as I feel a kinship to my queer sisters, that there's there's a degree of being on the outside. You know what concerns me really is that. Since this new administration has taken office, I, I feel that this um, gestalt of divisiveness is is moving into all kinds of areas of life that don't necessarily overtly present themselves as political. And so I get concerned about, um, you know, when people bash millennials or millennials bash, you know, so-called boomers. Um, until we figure out that we really need to work together, we will perish. And, and, and that concerns me when I see it um, raising its head, not just in a political realm, but in an everyday realm. I agree with you because um, I think that uh, as, an, as, a, as a man who's lived through the active generation, through Reagan and all of that, I feel like I have perspective that young people can benefit from, mm. but I also feel like young people have an energy that I no longer have. Right, right. That I can use to keep pushing on myself. Mm. So I think that there's a mutual beneficial beneficiality there. Yes, absolutely. You're and like I read at Thunberg, my gosh. Yeah, and but I feel it on this show, Jennifer. I do. And I'm not again. I'm not saying that just because you're sitting here. I'm very excited about this show returning. Oh, I'm so glad I am too. Tell me, uh, we're talking a lot about the activism, about you as yourself, with this with this piece. But what part of Bet were you excited to revisit as a woman? What part of her personality that you haven't got to play with as other women? that you wanted to play with this time? Well, parenting a teenager, you know, that, you know, Bet is not 
um, known for being the most easygoing person. And, and I was really curious to see how that would play out as she um, was in relation to her 16-year-old daughter who's in the midst of individuating and who needs space to do that and yet needs boundaries and, and figuring out how to, how to navigate that. I mean, for me, really, my number one love story in, in the first season is, is with my daughter. And I, I love that. And Jordan Hall plays my daughter, uh, Angie, and she's just phenomenal. Every day on set with her was so exciting. And it's her first job. Is it really? Yes, it's her first job. Oh, my God. Talk about terrifying. Yeah. But she's just so talented, just really relaxed and present. What was your first day on the set like? Surreal. Absolutely surreal. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, my first day with, with Kate and Leisha, that's when, because my first day was this, uh, I was in the office, well, I won't give it away, but it was this crazy sex scene with somebody I just met. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Baby. So, so Get like, ready. Okay, I'm back in the outward free Have now. sex ready. <laughs> it was, uh, it was um, in the cafe, in the uh, at the brunch scene in, with Kate and Leisha, and and it was just really surreal. It was it was so exciting. And and one of the things that was so exciting too was that we had this dream of bringing the show back. And there we were on the set. And you know, along with Eileen and Showtime and everybody, we 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 helped make that happen. And mm. that was very exciting. What was what was it like to play that kind of primal sexuality and sensuality on screen at? your age now because we're not seeing a lot of people who are older than 25 100. get down <laughs> you're not 100 <laughs> but you're not 25 right, and so right. you know we're meant to believe that you know people you know yours and my age we kind of get down with you know with our socks on <laughs> <laughs> Which can happen, and it's still well. Sexy. Listen, on a wintry night, yes, but <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's yeah. like that was damn. Right, right. Well, I think it's important. I mean, the sexuality doesn't go away. Oh no, no, it doesn't go away. So. What's it like to play that though? Um. Well, you you hook into the story. You know, you try to you hook into the story, and you're playing the story. So, you know. It's not just oh I'm having a sex scene. It's I'm um, I'm regenerating. I'm rejuvenating. I'm, mm. I'm this person is breathing life into me. The thing that is also exciting about this moment, and one of the reasons why I was very excited to see you today, is because I feel like this is a pressure point in a very interesting decade of your creative life, where you have played a really wonderful variety of women but you've also um very very smoothly taken the reins of the work you do both in front of the camera and behind the camera you're you're producing more you're actually pr executive producing another project right now as we speak aren't you mm -hmm. i have another project with eileen uh, called the seven husbands of evelyn hugo so when you return to something that was an iconic part of your creative landscape, mm -hmm. what does it make you feel about what you've gotten done over the last 10 years? I don't really think about it that way. It's, it's like being a Marine with a backpack going uphill. It's yeah? One foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. And, and paying attention to what excites me now, now, now. And, and realizing that okay, I'm excited about this thing now, this story has gripped me, how do I, how do I breathe life into it? How do I bring it to the screen? And, and usually I look for a partner, you know, that can, that I can work off of. I feel uh, working in relationship is, is much more gratifying and energizing to me. Um, I have another project called The Hive, uh, which is a book that I an idea that I had conceived of with with my one of my producing partners, Tom Jacobson, and originally we were thinking about it as a film. But as we started developing the idea, it became so complex that we thought, oh, maybe this would be good as a novel, starting off as a novel. And so we wrote a uh, treatment and we pitched it to a publisher who bought it, and then 
we asked Barry Liga and his wife Morgan Baden to write it, and they wrote it, and it came out in, in the fall. And we've been approached by a company now to turn it into a television series. So, um, so we're just weighing our options right now with that. But for me, it's really, I get excited about an idea at, in the moment, whether I'm hiking or swimming or usually in movement. And, uh, and then I look to see, oh, who can I walk on this path with? You know? do, you, do you ever allow yourself to assess not usually. I don't look back. I don't put it together. What happens when someone forces you to? Look at that. Look at the look on your face. You're so <laughs> cute. I can't take it. <laughs> there was because this delicious, like, kind of sly I'm smile. I'm going to poke oh. her just a little bit. A little bit. Um, like, what happens? What happens? It's interesting. Like, I think, oh, I've been alive for a while. <laughs> That's I've, what you think. I think I've been I've been alive for a while, and I've been extremely fortunate. I just think about most mostly. I think about it in terms of the people that I've been able to meet and the people that I've been able to experience, and and realizing that those people are my teachers in the way that you and I feel that way about you when I get to see you. Like I get to. I get I get to come here and experience you, which is so makes me so happy, Aww. and I always learn so much from you. Uh, the feeling is mutual, and uh, so that's what, how I when I look back, that's what I. Think. Well, I ask you that because I know that there are. You've had the kind of career where a lazy person will zero in on one thing, right? We'll sit here and talk about flash dance for an hour, or talk about. The L word for an hour. We'll talk about what, when, when you've done a million different things and when, when it actually adds up to a very provocative, progressive activist career. Uh, you know, like if you've never thought about it, well, then I'm going to yeah. this is what you're going to learn today <laughs> is that is that to to an observer who, who soaks it all in. It's very progressive, very provocative. And it's very much the work of an activist, whether it be on behalf of people you feel uh, a kinship with or whether it be on behalf of women. Mm. Because you don't play weak women. No, no. No, you play some tough broads. Yeah, yeah. Some, <laughs> some, some, some really dark ones, too. Some yeah. Really interesting dark um, ones. Um, and they're always fighting for something. Like, do you realize that you've got your proverbial boxing gloves on in almost every job you take? <laughs> a friend of mine said that I was a natural crusader, which <clears throat> I don't experience myself that way, but I, but I do experience myself as somebody who wants to be helpful. Like, I, I really would like to be helpful while I'm here. And, uh, and while I don't necessarily choose projects thinking... I, I want to change the world. I do choose things um, if they resonate with me. And, and clearly, I guess, there is this very big part of me that resonates to those stories that can maybe help make a shift or, or can be helpful in some way. How often do you write? Um, not often enough. Not often enough. But I've started writing more. And of course, like everyone else, I have a script in the drawer in my office. Yeah, but I don't mean a script. I mean, there's a larger story for you to tell. What you, is that? I'm not really oh, sure. Swami. <laughs> I'm not really sure. It's somewhere between a book and and a stage piece. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm very often projecting people on stage because I think that that is the most frightening mm. area that you could put an actor, and only very few can handle it. Mm. And a very liberating place to be. Well, in. because there's nowhere to go. You get you either do it or you don't. Right. You don't get to say wait, stop. Mm -hmm. Like we were saying earlier off mic, you can't you can't lunge over something and say <laughs> stop. Right. It's just moving. Right. Right. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Because then you get all that room to dive into your imagination with nobody stopping you. So what scares you? Uh, sharks. Sharks scare you. Yeah. Like I love open water swimming. And and uh, and certainly, I, I've already acclimated myself to to the unknown, 
um, you know, when you get in the water, you can't, often you can't see the bottom. Um, but uh, yeah, sharks still scare me. But in terms of psychologically, you mean? Like life. Life. Oh. Not being able to be helpful. Whatever would stop me from being helpful. Or or being, um, if, if I ever became so self-obsessed or something that I didn't see the bigger picture, that would be a nightmare. You know, that would be a nightmare. When did you... Oh, my God, that made me just sick thinking about it. Did it? Yes, yes, yes. Just to be thinking about yourself all the time. It's exhausting. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting. It's also, it's, it's guaranteed to make you sick. Yes, and it's a very basic acting exercise where you put your attention on the other person. Yeah. And as soon as you put your attention on the other person, liberation follows. And I think that that's also true in life. Oh yes, you know. because as I can tell you, as, as someone who deals with uh, depression, which is which I, many people really hate when I say this. I view as a being a very narcissistic affliction, because when you're depressed, all you're thinking about is how, me, 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 me. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Blah, 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 blah. And when you're forced to stop, and look and say, "Oh my God, he has it way worse." <laughs> Then you have no choice but to take a deep breath, mm -hmm. say thank you, and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a very similar experience, right? Yes, yeah. Um, before they kick me out of here, um, I have one last Wait, question. Oh, no. I know. So we're just we're yeah. just going to pretend Lock we don't. Lock the door. We're not. We're going to pretend Lock we don't see him for for two more minutes. Okay, good. Because I have one more question. I I like. I knew I was going to see you two weeks ago. And I'm like, okay. I have to ask her the one thing I've never asked her before. When did you know? that you are not going to take shit from people. Because the thing I admire the most about you is how you'll say, I want this, and you're not mean. There's right. nothing nasty about you, just like you know who you are, you know what you want, and you just keep it moving. When did you become that person? I'm, Someone I'm, will benefit from it today. I am the middle girl between two boys. <laughs> <laughs> so I am both a peacekeeper and get off of me or I'll punch you in the head person. So it's it's those two things and I, I think really early on I had that and, I, and I'm grateful to my brothers for that. And I'm grateful to growing up on the south side of Chicago for that. Like you can't, you can't sit back. And n you're not gonna get anywhere by um, trying to maintain the status quo or always pleasing people. And getting back to the show, that is one of the most exciting things about this new generation, is that they are redefining, you know, how we think about gender identity and sexual orientation. They are refusing to be categorized, and that's that whole mindset can be shifted into other areas of life. Because really, what you're talking about is authenticity, and and what are you willing to do to be your most authentic self? And, and that authentic self will help others. But before we go, I know there's people at the door, but I'm going to ignore them. What are you most afraid of? I'm afraid of missing the rest of my life because I missed a big chunk of it, mm. being worried all the time. Right. So I'm trying really hard in my 50s to be visibly present at all times, mm -hmm. which is why I always make people I like, like you, sit in a way that I could see your whole body, <laughs> as opposed to over there, which feels like a different zip code to me mentally. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm terrified of missing time. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified of it. Mm -hmm. It worries me hourly. Yeah, right. because I am a people pleaser and I say yes and then I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, the day's gone, what happened? <laughs> so yeah, Jennifer Beals. I adore you. I adore you, too. I have really, I mean, you just make my heart sing, and they're like literally opening the doors as we speak. We'll just go out for coffee later. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Look for Jennifer Beals on the L Word Generation Q Sundays on Showtime. Don't miss it.